Okay, we are good to go. Hello, everybody. So grateful to be with us here at ULT San Diego for the Aquarian series. This evening's special presentation is on William Kwan Judge, one of the great founders of the Theosophical Movement, and that will be given to us by Miss Helena Karakazi. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, tonight uh, to a little presentation on uh, someone who's very near and dear to my heart. Um, and uh, a lot of people who come across the United Lodge of Theosophists uh, in their theosophical studies say, well, who's this William Q. Judge? What did he do? And uh, how can we learn more about him? And the way that I learned about him is through his is his work. Uh, and I think the work speaks to um, the depth of his wisdom as a student of occultism and stretches uh, beyond the years that he was on earth. Uh, if we read through his body of work, what I think of as I read the Telltale Picture Gallery or <clears throat> Echoes from the Orient uh, and his articles is I found someone who seems to have had uh, pretty conscious contact with his past lives and was clearly uh, quite capable of steering his vehicle, <laughs> you know, his, his physical garments uh, in in a, a direction that an accomplished being who was working on these ideas and practices for many lifetimes carrying over um, and the ease and the grace and the humility you know, is, is just to me, um, fascinating and i wish we had more beings many more beings like him uh, but it's no coincidence that he's one of the co-founders of our modern theosophical movement so uh, it's one of my favorite pictures of him uh just that look in his eyes that little smile in his eyes uh, to me, uh, says it, uh, says so much uh, about him. Uh, he was, you know, basic facts. He was born 1851 and died. Um, we're celebrating his life tonight in 1896. <clears throat> so sort of short life, but boy, did he make the most of it, I think. And... Uh, Oops, <clears throat> let me get the screen to move. Hmm. Uh, his early days, uh, William Q. Judge was born in Dublin, Ireland, uh, right around St. Patrick's Day, right? He emigrated at the age of 13 to the United States. By the age of 21, he had passed the bar. It was a different process then. Uh, he, he's he's really credited with keeping the organization going when Alcott and HPV went to India. It was entrusted to him here in America. Um, and in 1876, uh, on a trip to uh, South America, he contracted a fever. And so on top of everything else, you know, he was working through his uh, vehicle. Now, um, there's a book of daily quotations uh, that 
I read through, I actually published it on Facebook one day at a time. And uh, it's extracted from the Vernal Blooms, the Ocean of Theosophy, Letters That Have Helped Me, uh, Echoes from the Orient, the Notes on the Gita, the Yoga Aphorisms of Patanjali, the Heart Doctrine, and various articles from the Theosophical Movement. Uh, you can download a copy of it at that link, uh, theosophy-ult.org.uk, uh, and you can also purchase it uh, online. So I tried to cull, like a good fisherwoman, <laughs> uh, um, some of those quotations, because <laughs> I think they say so much about how he understood practical occultism, and he gives us a lot of hints about what might help us with our uh, practice and understanding uh, of theosophy. Uh, so I tried not to pick the most obvious quotes that most of us are familiar with uh, and uh, beat them to death, but pick, tried to pick significant ones. So I'll try to read them, <clears throat> and let's see what the effect is on your daily life uh, uh, as you come to this meeting and to this point uh, on on this day. And maybe you can gauge how you feel after uh, we've we've gone through them and see if you've had some sort of a shift. So I want to make this a little interactive with um, with you today. <clears throat> There's a quote from Robert Crosby. Uh, WQJ knew the path that all would have to tread. And balm, advice, warning, and encouragement will be found in his writings at every turn and for every circumstance of life. The closer one gets into the current that flows from him, the greatest of the exiles, the more readily will these things which harass and distress fall away and become as nothing. The entry on January 17th. Nothing is gained, but a great deal is lost by impatience. Not only strength, but also insight and intuition. So decide nothing hastily. Wait, make no set plan. Wait for the hour to make the decision. For if you decide in advance of the time, you tend to raise confusion. <clears throat> January 26th. Do not, as theosophists, confine yourselves to the intellect. The dry or the interesting speculations upon all the details of cosmogony and anthropology will not save the world. They do not cure sorrow, nor appeal to those who feel the grinding stones of fate and know not why it should be so. Address yourselves to using your intellectual knowledge of these high matters so as to affect practically the hearts of men. January 27th, I pray you to remove from your mind any distaste for present circumstances. Well, that's a challenge. <laughs> January 29th, the future for each will come from each present moment. As we use the moment, so we shift the future up or down, for good or ill, for the future being only a word for the present, not yet come. We have to see to the present more than all. If the present is full of doubt or vacillation, so will be the future. If full of confidence, calmness, hope, courage and intelligence, thus also will be the future. 
<clears throat> January 30th. Do not stop to consider your progress at all, because that is the way to stop it. <laughs> but take your mind off the question of your progress and do the best you can. February 22nd. All things come to him who waits in the right way. Make yourself in every way as good an instrument as you can. When the hour strikes, it will then find you ready. You see, Judge was in his own life, in his own mission, emulating that. You know, there were times when he faced tremendous obstacles. When no one came to the meetings, he held them anyway. He was always preparing himself, always preparing himself with faith. March 2nd. If you desire to labor for the good of the world, it will be unwise for you to strive to include it all at once in your efforts. If you can help elevate or teach but one soul, that is a good beginning and more than is given to many. <laughs> March 8th. Harmony does not come through likeness. Harmony comes from a balancing of diversities and discord from any effort to make harmony by force. I think Jean would like that one. March 13th, we must not lose faith for an instant, for it is this faith that clears the air up there I'm thinking up there in my brain, and that enables us to get help from all quarters. Faith. <clears throat> March 14th. If you are striving for light and initiation, remember this, that your cares will increase, <coughs> your trials thicken, your family make new demands upon you, he who can understand and pass through these patiently, wisely, placidly may hope. Tuned. We must not lose faith for an instant, for it is faith that clears the air up there. March 16th. I want you to stop as much as possible any wish to progress. The intense desire to know and to become and to reach the light is different from the thought. I am not progressing. I know nothing. The latter is looking for results. The right position to take is the wish to be. For then we know. The wish to know is almost solely intellectual and the desire to be of the heart. March 18th. Arouse, arouse in yourself the meaning of thou art that. Thou art the self. This is the thing to think of in meditation. And if you believe it, then tell others the same. You have read it before, but now try to realize it more and more each day, and you will have the light you want. In this, in this quote from Judge, I can understand why he brought a thousand people to the World Parliament of Religions. You see that? And if you believe it, then tell others the same. Don't keep it to yourself. <clears throat> March 30th, the processes of preparation go silently on till the individual, all unconscious, reaches the moment when the one needed force touches him and then every prepared constituent falls instantly into place and the being is, as it were, reconstructed at once. 
So all that work that we're doing brings us to a point and then is activated. <clears throat> March 31st, do not allow discouragement to come in. Time is needed for all growth and all change and all development. Let time have her perfect work and do not stop it. <clears throat> April 20th, try to make it a part of your inner mind that it is no use to worry, that things will be all right no matter what comes, and that you are resolved to do what you see before you and trust to karma for all the rest. April 29th, the more violent the storm, the sooner shall we see the face of the sun, which shines behind the clouds that hide it, only for a very little while. May 4th, let us meditate on that which is in us as the highest self, concentrate upon it and will to work for it as dwelling in every human heart. May 11. You will have to take care that the spirit of the time and the wickedness and the apathy of the people do not engender in you a bitter spirit. <clears throat> May 15th. True or false, no accusation against another person should ever be spread abroad. Keep silent about such things with everyone not directly concerned. But if your discretion and silence are likely to hurt or endanger others, then I add, speak the truth at all costs. <laughs> <clears throat> May 19th. The follower of the Bhagavad Gita gradually comes to see that the true devotion is that which has but one object through all changes of scene, of thought, or of companionship, that object is the self which is all in all. <clears throat> May 23rd, nothing is gained by worrying. You do not alter people, and by being anxious as to things, you put an occult obstacle in the way of what you want done. Wow. It is better to acquire a lot of what is called carelessness by the world, but is in reality a calm reliance on the law and a doing of one's own duty, satisfied that the results must be right, no matter what they may be. And I think William Q. Judge engendered that so well. A calm reliance on the law from life to life to life. <clears throat> May 29th. To make our will strong, we must have fewer desires. Let those be high, pure, and altruistic. They will give us strong will. <clears throat> June 11th. It is not necessary to be conscious of the progress one has made. We make a good deal of progress in our inner hidden life of which we are not at all conscious. We do not know of it until some later life. It is best to go on with duty and to refrain from this trying to taste stock and measuring of our progress. <clears throat> June 16th, the brain is only the focus through which the forces and thoughts are centralized that are continually coming in through the solar plexus of the heart. Many such thoughts are lost, just as millions of seeds in nature are lost. It behooves us to study them and to guard them when there. June 25th. Inasmuch as we are a universal brotherhood, which thinks it has some hold of some true doctrines, it is our duty to give out those rules of thought and conduct, and conduct which the world so much needs. June 29th, not a single good theosophic life is lost. 
but every one of us affects not only the immediate associates, but also projects into the great universal current an influence that has its weight in the destiny of the race. June 30th, stand firm, avoid controversy, and continue work. <clears throat> July 3rd, that law is immutably fixed, which declares that he who has received spiritual benefit, no matter how little, must not willingly die unless he has communicated that which he has received to at least one other person. And therein, it is also stated that by communicating is meant not merely verbal delivery, but patient care until that other person fully understands. <clears throat> July 24th. The tendency of the mind is to wander from subject to subject, and so we should try to follow the advice of the Bhagavad Gita. To whatsoever object the inconstant mind goeth out, he should subdue it and bring it back and place it on the spirit. July 18th. We have been here so many times that we ought to be beginning to learn and we have not only been here, but beyond doubt, those of us who are inwardly and outwardly engaged in the theosophical movement for the good of others have been in a similar movement before this life. This being so, and there being yet many more lives to come, what is the reason we should in any way be downcast? July 24th, be temperate in all things most of all, in condemnation of other men. July 25th, vanity represents the great illusion of nature. It brings up before the soul all sorts of erroneous or evil pictures and drags the judgment so away that anger or envy will enter or such course be pursued that violent destruction by outside causes falls upon the being. So that egotism, the words are a little different, you know, it's a Victorian era, but we get the we get the idea, we see it here today. Egotism, egoism, the great illusion, <clears throat> dragging up all this anger, envy, and a violent ending up in a violent destruction befalling upon us. July 30th, if we are anxious, we raise a barrier against progress by perturbation and straining harshly. August 4th, family duty consists in cultivating and elevating the emotional nature of ourselves and of our family. In being equally kind, not only to the members of the family, but also to all creatures. That's interesting, that correlation on the emotional nature of our family relationships, especially. <clears throat> August 8th, did you ever reflect that the mere passing sight of a picture or a single word instantly lost in the rush of the world may be the basis for a dream that will poison the night and react upon the brain the next day, even a little thought get through like that. August 12th, HPB's date. HPB was and is one of those servants of the Universal Lodge sent to the West to take up the work, well knowing of the pain an obloquy and the insult to the very soul, worst of all insults, which were certain from the first to be hers, as well as judges. <clears throat> August 19th, it is not what is done, but the spirit in which the least thing is done that is counted. Hear the word of the master. He who does the best he knows how and that he can do does enough for us. August 20th, 
Envy is not a mere trifle that produces no physical result. It has a powerful action. It not only hinders the further development, but attracts to the student's vicinity thousands of malevolent beings of all classes that precipitate themselves upon him and wake up or bring on every evil passion. Ouch. <clears throat> September 3rd, fear is the same thing as frigidity on the earth. Its effect is to shrivel up, but it is a hindrance that will disappear by means of knowledge, for fear is always the son of ignorance. Right? This was uh, over 100 years ago. September 13th, by example, you can do much, as also by a word in due season. September 19th, the fathers, that is the spirits of just men made perfect, those who lived and worked for humanity ages ago and who are now out of our sphere, nevertheless still influence us in that their spiritual forces flow down on this earth for all pure souls. September 21st, the great workers are behind us, to my personal knowledge, and not behind me only, but behind all sincere workers. I know that their desire is that each should listen to the voice of his inner self. Then the unseen helpers are able to help all the more. September 21st, don't fail to exercise your common sense on each and every occasion. <clears throat> November 5th, as we are striving to reach God, we must learn to be as near like him as possible. <clears throat> December 6th, if I cannot see the road nor the goal for the fog, I would simply sit down and wait. I would not allow the fog to make me think no road was there and that I was not to pass it. The fogs must lift. And I, I can see Judge doing that. <clears throat> December 8th. Persevere. And little by little, new ideals and thought forms will drive out of you the old ones. This is the eternal process. December 15th. The past cannot be changed or amended. That which belongs to the experiences of the present cannot and should not be shunned. But alike to be shunned are disturbing anticipations or fears for the future, and every act or impulse that may cause present or future pain to ourselves or others. Right? Stay present. <clears throat> December 18th. We have, each one of us, to make ourselves a center of light, a picture gallery from which shall be projected on the astral light such scenes, such influences, such thoughts as may influence many for good, shall thus arouse a new current and then finally result in drawing back the great and good from other spheres and beyond the earth. Okay, that's it for me. Uh, I wonder uh, how this uh, struck you. Uh, and uh, if any of them helped you to shift. Um, thank you so much uh, for this, Helena. What a wonderful way uh, to present Mr. Judge to us by way of his own words. Just lovely. Um, my first question is pretty practical. I wanted to know um, the name of this uh, publication that you were reading from.
it is actually I had um, a link to it, uh, which I could share. Let me just make sure it's up. Oh, maybe it disappeared. But it is on the uh, website for, let's see, the ULT in mm -hmm. the UK. Okay. okay. It's called a book. Oh, here, I found it. <clears throat> so I can share the screen. And okay. I was actually able now, right? Uh, can you see this? Oh, yes, I'm seeing it. I think oh. everybody can see it. A book of quotations. A book of quotations from William Q. Judge and lovely website, lots of events and articles. And um, if you scroll down uh, right here, you can download the whole book for free and carry it around with you. So I Lovely. You can do that on your phone. <laughs> you know, on your phone now. You can that carry the so secret good. doctrine around with you. I mean, who, yeah. it's like magic, really, when you think about it. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. I see some of us uh, busily writing it down. So good to go. All right. So we have a question uh, from Judy Salzman. Hello, Judy. Yeah, hello, Helena. Thank you for a lovely presentation on Judge, uh, uh, such a very important figure in the Theosophical movement. And I, I am wondering if we could elaborate on the idea that he seems to present that we shouldn't worry about progress because that is really self-concern. The Bhagavad Gita says, my disciple is unexpecting because I have known people. I remember I met someone at Adiyar who said she was going to go to an ashram until she meditated, until something happened. Well, I didn't know what she expected to happen, and I, I hope she was successful. But it seems that expectation and personal progress is not something we should worry about because it goes right back to the ego. You know, what are people going to think of me or, you know, am I doing better rather than am I just doing my duty in a detached way? And that seems to be what I'm getting out of all this. So what do you think about it? Well, thanks. It's so good to see you, <laughs> Judy, and to hear you. Uh, you've been on my mind uh, in, in a good way. Uh, yes, you know, we have, I think, you know, different parts of our nature and, um, they have their place, but we may at times, uh, get confused and give them pri a priority that they don't really innately have, you know, when <clears throat> our our brain warns us about things. Uh, it's not so that we should walk around worrying all the time. It's just uh, a part of our being uh, warning us about things. And we can say thank you for the information and move on. <clears throat> but if we fixate on just one aspect of our being, <clears throat> um, it, it can, we can get stuck. We can get stuck for so many different reasons. And I think that's where I really admire Judge for, uh, you know, his ability to discern the subtleties of our being and the different places where uh, we might get stuck uh, unwittingly and and say, gee, you know, wow, I, I, uh, uh, I don't, I, I don't want to do that. You know, that might be working at cross purposes oops uh to um my my journey and i think um you know when we take stock of ourselves well you know there's the daily meditation the evening meditation that we have <clears throat> to take stock of ourselves in a healthy way uh to say all right um i did what i could i did the best i could uh, i need to let go of that now 
and I need to um, keep moving. You know, I shouldn't be uh, stuck um, in just thinking about myself, like you said, you know, and, and we live in a world where, right, we grow up and we get grades and we get tested and, um, uh, you know, we're uh, uh, getting directed from our parents and our peers and our mentors. And we're trying to uh, be an architect of our being. Uh, and interacting with other people. But uh, then again, uh, we might think that's what our job is to do all day, is to beat ourselves up. You can see, I think a lot of that also uh, in a religious or cultural upbringing, you know, can be dependent on how much of that you're exposed to or your family or home uh, environment. Uh, and uh, it can it can be good to put the brakes on it and realize that it's okay up to a point, but um, not to make it a constant thought process so that we're beating ourselves up all the time or, um, or encouraging others to do that. So they're expecting some type of eternal damnation you know, um, mm -hmm. as a result, some Armageddon, you know, um, in the future, because uh, that's not the way life works. Although some people would like us to think that <laughs> it's it's their own limited uh, vision. And uh, we, you know, we, we want people, we can, we can do better. <clears throat> um, so thank you, Judy. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see here in the chat from Kelly Lopez to everyone. She says, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. And yes, it helped me transform. Just beautiful. I had a question, Helena, about you said briefly that Mr. Judge, uh, even when no one was coming to the many lodges that he uh, set up, he would go through all the uh, formalities himself. And I wondered if he could speak a little bit more about that entire thing um, with uh, Madam HPB and I think Olcott uh, away in India and him uh, busy opening a hundred lodges. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I I wonder at times what it must have felt like to be around Judge or HPB, you know, what kind of energy they had. I, I think they were both forces of nature to be reckoned with, but that HPB would just trust him from the moment that they met. Uh, she's must have seen something extraordinary in him that he had that ability, you know, that it, it was, it was there. And, um, to understand, um, on, on a very deep level, uh, the importance of the work, um, and, uh, no dilly dallying uh, to move forward, uh, and um, and I'm sure there were all, all in his letters that have helped me. You know, and that's interesting too. Letters he's getting letters asking help, but he 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 looks at it as how these letters helped him, <laughs> and how how humble that is uh, from his point of view that. Uh, he got a lot out of being there for other people and helping them where he could. And we can't help everybody, but we can try. And I'm sure there were very many people, you know, that uh, that he did help. Uh, so there is always opportunity for learning and for growth uh, and for cultivating. Uh, wisdom 
and calm and uh, laying down those lines of force is really what he was doing. And HPB did the same thing. You know, they set up uh, these lines of force uh, around the world when, when you think about it. You know, they uh, they took their mission very seriously. I mean, uh, and, and they didn't have the benefit, right, of computers, the internet, telephone, uh, yes. airplanes. You know, they did it um, by horse-drawn carriages, <laughs> you know, by boat, <laughs> uh, Pony Express. Um, so to, in the face of all that, you know, have the faith that, this was a mission that was worth everything, you know, um, and the sacrifice uh, and uh, the slander, you know, from the beginning, you know, they knew when they took up uh, this path that there, there, there would be consequences that it was not going to be a comfortable ride. <clears throat> uh, they, you know, they knew that going in and they accepted it um, because they'd been there before. So they knew what the path had looked like and they were resolute and prepared, you know, to put their ship, their little ship on, on the ocean. Uh, uh, and they've helped us to navigate these waters of life uh, and uh, to drive our own cell boats, you know, through uh, through these trouble uh, waters. I mean, smooth seas don't make skillful sailors, they say, you know, you got to have some experience. Um, and, but then that's such a great gift when you can teach someone how to sail, you know, through life. And I think their example to us is about that. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, there was a recent class in theosophy where the term something to the effect of the intelligent use of adversity mm -hmm. to be sure that we get something from it. It's definitely bound to give us strength on the path. Um, Judy, did you have a question or, or, or is your hand up from before. Did you have another question? You're still muted. Oh, she... No, there's no question. Oh, okay. All right. And this thing and the action is very poor on it. I'm trying to get the hand down. Oh, okay. Came down. No worries. No worries. Okay, I'm looking here. Is this from Laura in chat? I'll read it anyway. It says, Judge is said in theosophical writings to have been an advanced soul using a borrowed body. What does this mean? Please elaborate. That's from Laura? <laughs> I no, so. that's from LAS. From LAS. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going by the first initial, Laura. Please forgive me. Okay. LAS. Okay. Well, I think this goes back uh, to that idea of, well, a couple of ways to put it. You can look at a sailor steering his boat. Uh, you can look at um, an archer right, uh, with his bow and arrow, you can look at Krishna and Arjuna in the chariot. <clears throat> and uh, Judge was one of those advanced beings that, um, you know, they have that saying, does, do you wear the dress or does it wear you? You know, mm. and and for for most of us, right, uh, we're in our physical bodies, um, 
and uh, we're not really conscious of it. And uh, we're focused on being that body when that's a tiny portion of who we really are. And I think Judge was able uh, to have, um, as a result of his past lifetimes and work, I mean, uh, all these uh, pithy sayings, uh, you know, I mean, you could take one of those phrases and meditate on them for years and lifetimes. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, he had a great deal of wisdom that came from practice and uh, past life experience so that he was able to uh, command the use of the vehicles that he entered into. And that's what all um, those of great soul, the adepts, the Mahatmas are able to do. Uh, consciously uh, able to do. I mean, it's, it's one thing uh, to be a part of life uh, as a passive spectator. It's another to be consciously aware of your co-divinity, <laughs> if, if you will, and, and that we're, there's a part of us that we can open up to that is much, much greater uh, than the sum of our parts, much, much greater. And that's, I hope, uh, would help to answer that question. Thank you. Robert? Are, are you a, a sailor, Lena? You do sailing? I'm, I'm not very good at sailing, but sailing through life, yes. But I have great admiration. I love the water, you know, and being um, on the water and uh, boating. You know, I've done uh, a lot of boating and been on the water. Must have been on it in past lifetimes, too. Uh, that's because I have a great love of being by the water. <laughs> Why do you ask? <laughs> well, you're using those analogies, so I, I thought maybe... You know, you're basing it on your own experience. But I actually have a real question. <laughs> <laughs> Independent of that. Um, <clears throat> the uh, HPB at one time called Judge her only friend. But they didn't actually spend that much time together. You know, just three years in America, and then he visited India. So I wondered what you made of a statement like that. Is that instructive to us at all? <clears throat> well, you know, uh, well, just drawing from my personal experience, uh, some of the people that I love and admire the most in my life, uh, and I feel um closest to I spend the least amount of time with, you know, uh, but I know I can pick up the phone or they can pick up the phone and call me in a pinch. And they're there for me, like a thousand percent. And and so we move on in our lives, but uh they're constants and I, I feel like Judge and HPB also had that type of beyond camaraderie. They're, they recognized the work, uh, that they were coming back to it. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, they, they went out to divide and conquer and tackle that job. Uh, you know, they didn't spend a lot of frivolous time <laughs> hanging out. They just, to me, uh, they got right back into the business and they took it very, very seriously. Um, and uh, they had that confidence in each other, you know, but uh, just because uh, you don't see someone all the time, maybe it's it's just 
the way it plays out that we need to spend more time with people like that, right, in our lives. But a lot of the times, you know, we end up spending a lot of time with um, other and different people. But I think they were also very wrapped up in service. You know, they were really devoted to serving humanity, you know. So, um, and they knew that they both had that, you know, um, sense of a mission and confidence in the other. So they just were in business, you know. They they just they didn't have to be with each other on the physical plane. I think that they were spiritually so connected over so many lifetimes that you ever have a friend like that where, you know, you just know that a person like that exists in the world and Mm -hmm. it inspires you, you know, you know, to just keep, keep at it, you know, to keep plugging away uh, at it. Thank you. Beautiful. Ken, you have a question? Okay, sure. Hello there, Helena. Thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation of those quotes. I was um, struck by one of them from June um, 16th about the brain uh, being connected through the solar plexus and the vagus nerve. (laughs) Given your background in uh, neurophysiology, I was wondering, do you think that the higher manas uh, communicates to um, our heart and the um, the so-called um, solar plexus area in the middle of our body, and then maybe through the vagus nerve in the in the shula serira, you know, physical manifestation of us, how it interfaces with our physical brain. That you know, modern Western objectives, materialistic science thinks it's all it's all in the brain, but really we have these other parts, including the enteric nervous system and the the heart nervous system. So do you think that that's the way that the higher manas gets in touch with us? Yes, and in that quote, um, one of the things uh, that struck me was he says that forces work through the brain, that they come in, though, through the heart. Forces, and uh, you're giving the talk on forces tomorrow? (laughs) <laughs> uh, yes, of course, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, and I thought, wow, what synchronicity is there? Because, uh, and I'm glad that you brought it up because I wanted you uh, or I wanted people to get that feeling because uh, what is a force? You know, what are we talking about? You know, and uh, so for everybody tomorrow at 1.30, San, no, 1.30 Eastern time, 10.30 San Diego time, uh, Ken is going to really enlighten us about this uh, understanding of forces. <laughs> but, um, uh, and Gene, I don't know if Gene is here, uh, if he's, um, uh, Gene talks about this from time to time as well. Bill uh, just listening. <laughs> but but the heart, Gene, what, what's the physical part of the heart or is the metaphysical part of the heart? Uh, metaphysical part of the heart, and the short answer is that before we get to the higher, we've got to go through the astral. And so we have to understand the connection that exists between the incarnating ray and the elements of our constitution as it incarnates and settles in the, quote, heart, end quote. And what's is it? Is it the sinus? Uh, there's a name uh, for well, the uh, sinus. The sinus node uh, as the pacemaker uh, that then um, connects with the sinovent- uh, sinoventricle to the Purkinje's, and then spreads out from the top to the atrial chambers. So there, there are seven connections there through the the nervous system. And then, as Ken said, the vagus nerve has a connection there, but that has a connection with the heart, with the lungs, with the stomach, with the solar area, and with the sexual areas in the uh, sacral, um, the whole sacral section, lumbar section, thoracic section, and um, cervical 
cervical and brachial. So, I mean, they're, they're, you know, that's the traveling nerve. Um, and it's tied into the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Um, and then leads into the brainstem that connects it to, depending upon what pathways we're looking at, the connections in the brain uh, that may or may not be directly connected with the life in the heart. So again, I mean, that's judges uh, astral anatomy. And, and that's why we say we've got to have that understood before we can really look at the higher mind um, in its relationship to the heart. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jean and, and Helena. You know, modern psychologists talk about EQ or emotional intelligence. And for 25, 30 years, people have been postulating that our IQ, intelligent, rational mind, and our intellectual our, and our emotional mind make decisions for us through the amygdala and all that sort of thing. And so this quote about the heart, that these forces enter through the heart, could that be saying that we really have to give more emphasis to the so-called emotional intelligence? Yes, and um, it's there must be seven right types of emotional intelligence, right? A higher and a lower. There's um, uh, a, a little story I want to give you, Ken. I was um, at a biofeedback conference, and um, you know they try to. Uh, uh, study all, all different types of things, right? Consciousness and the soul and uh, after what happens after death. And there was um, a student whose father uh, had done 20 some odd years of EKG studies, the rhythms of the heart. And uh, he suddenly passed away. And his daughter felt, uh, she's, you know, terribly upset. And she felt, I have to continue his work and publish his results. You know, all that work. It might have been 30 years work of, worth of EKG. And um, so she didn't know how she was going to do it, but the people in the community, you know, got together and said, yeah, we're going to help you. We've got to publish his work. And um, they hooked her up. Now, they had hooked him up a bunch of times to his EKG. They had a record of his heart rhythm. And they hooked her up, and they found another rhythm besides her rhythm. And they were trying to figure out what it was. And then she recognized it was her father's heart rhythm. And that in her space, right, he was still connecting with her through her heart rhythm. And, and that was really amazing. There was no doubt about, you know, this being. So when we talk about the astral, you know, our higher self and that light, that heartbeat, that rhythm, where does it come from? And it keeps going. <laughs> You know, it's more more than just our physical heart rhythm so that, you know, with the heart math studies as well, you know, we generate um, that heartbeat and it sends out a pulse, you know, 20, 30 feet outside of us, our physical astral body, if you would like to call it, you know, the, the grossest, more most material part of it. We can actually monitor that now. We have the technology. And when somebody enters a room, you know, their field will reach out and touch your field. And you will have an immediate sense of go or no go, friend or foe. You know, should I avoid this person? Should I ignore this person? Should I, you know, do I have karma with this person, right? If there's a connection from a past life. And all of that has to be somewhere in the memory, right? The astral is the recorder, the memory of our being. And so uh, we might not exactly remember the exact moment that this person uh, was our lover, our husband, our wife, our child, our teacher, 
our mentor, um, uh, uh, a, a child, you know, uh, a classmate, you know, but the soul knows, the soul knows. I mean, when you think about it, it's amazing how people interact with each other and why they're moved, right? <laughs> you know, they're moved. Why are we moved to do the things that we do? Why are we moved to study theosophy? I love the quote where he says, um, hey, guys, um, don't don't be depressed. Don't be so down. We've been at this for lifetimes. We're coming back and we're just doing it again. Just the way Judge and Blavatsky picked it up and did it again. And I love the way he says, don't just sit on the information. Well, hey, do something about it. Go out there, you know, bring it, you know, back out to help people. Keep it alive, you know, keep it alive. And and that it's our duty. You know, I think they both com felt very compelled that it was their dharma uh, and their duty. And they're wonderful examples you know, uh, from uh, our recent past. And uh, yeah, and uh, what an inspiration. I hope um, that if anything, uh, it inspires us, especially, you know, in these troubled times. They had troubled times then too. And he said, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Just with faith, calmness, right? His last words, hold it steady keep going. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Uh, thank uh, you, Ken. I hope to be bring there. Back I hope Monica. everybody else is too. Monica? Yeah, we got a nice group here. Yeah. <laughs> well, Helena, thank you so much. Do we have any more questions? Oh, I'm seeing here in the chat. Uh, <laughs> Nathan Johnston says, wow. My sentiments exactly. Uh, LAS says, with all of his spiritual knowledge, why was he ill most of his life? And why did he die so young at 45 years? I was a Mahatma. I might have better answers, but I'm not. So I can only hazard... I guess. I mean, HPB and uh, Judge had some formidable physical obstacles. And uh, a lot of those early theosophists, right, the translators, the young men around them, you know, there was a lot of illness. We didn't live as long. Um, he certainly made the most of his life that he had. But, you know, in terms of illness, um, severe illness. One of the things that can happen, and we've seen this with shamans, um, where uh, in some of these, you know, tribal cultures, um, the shaman was someone who had uh, earlier in his life experienced um, a tragedy or a severe illness. And what that can do <clears throat> is um, make us, in a sense, more porous to other aspects of our being, because you need to be more in your astral being, right, when you're sick, because that's where the pattern body is, you know, your your whole self. So... Oftentimes, um, well, look at uh, Helen Keller. Uh, she couldn't see, she couldn't hear, but she's very much alive. You know, she, uh, her, her soul and other aspects of her brain compensated for her shortfalls. And uh, that's the plastic nature of our being. You know, we see people who have tremendous challenges and they are able to walk through them and also uh, with strength and a fortitude that's uh, almost superhuman. But we have all of us have access to that. You know, when we see uh, these great beings like Judge uh, take on 
uh, a disadvantaged uh, type of an existence. You know, for him, he, you know, he accepted it and with grace. You know, when he talks about his past lives, um, he seems so calm as he's walking through and really walking the talk of accepting. Now, acceptance of today, your life, is so important. A lot of times, you know, we can get caught in, I wish it were better. I wish I had more money. I wish I had a successful career. I wish I wrote that book already, you know, and <laughs> instead of living uh, in, in the here and now. But uh, he was certainly uh, an example, you know, for uh, people who suffer from illness and disease and all different sorts of setbacks. It, it's amazing that those two got done as much as they did <laughs> with the life that they had. They really made the most of it, where mo most of the rest of us probably would have fainted and given up. I mean, they, if anything, uh, you know, those rough waters uh, you know, when you think about it, when because we choose our incarnations up to a point, and if it's a little bit rough, well, if it were smooth and easy go going, what would happen to us, right? If we weren't challenged, would we grow? Would we hold on to our virtues if we didn't have any practice? Uh, maybe we picked these places to learn because our souls knew they needed to hold on tight to these virtues and they can be easily lost and squandered. You know, you see that people have tremendous gifts and, you know, they don't know what to do with them or uh, the tremendous resources or, you know, they get burned out philanthropically. They get bored. They don't see what the point of it is. You know, they don't really appreciate that give and take, you know, um, of the path, of service, of charity. It, you know, it becomes, like he says, empty words, you know, and, uh, you know, intellectually even, Judge challenged us, you know, you don't want to just carry the message and, you know, literally. That's not where... The work is. The work is much more um, present, compassionate, you know, from our heart quality. You know, it's, it's not some type of uh, rote practice that we engage in. We, we put our whole being, our whole being uh, into those exchanges with our fellow human beings and with the one light. And that's how we grow spiritually. That's how we retain that wisdom from life to life to life, which maybe he, yeah, he said, yeah, I want to, I want to hold on to this. So yeah, it's going to be a little bit rough, but it's going to shape me. It's going to shape my future, my destiny. And I bring it on, bring it on. Lovely. Robert, you have another question for Helena? Well, I just think it's important also to note that uh, Judge was an ordinary person. <laughs> and we are told that HBB's life was artificially prolonged. And she agreed to it uh, because it was important, the work that she could do by her life being prolonged. So if we understand the nature of the Mahatma and their knowledge, then we can be assured that if it would have been a benefit, Judge would have lived longer. Uh, but as it was, uh, his work at that time, we could say, is was completed. That was the the best thing that could be done at that time. Anyhow, it's something to think about. Plus, this whole thing about a borrowed body, 
he wrote us he, he wrote the sketch for a story called living in a borrowed body where he talks about a an india a, a man in india in Raja, who is asked to enter into this body of a westerner during the, the night and animate that and then he would animate his Indian body during the day. So he just made that sketch of a story. And it's something to think about in relation to the nature of William Kwan Judd. Thank you. David. Oh, hi, Helena. Thanks for everything tonight. I, I was going to say one thing, though, too. You know, Judge had his challenges. Uh, it's kind of a, a strange karmic thing, but he was trying to uh, uh, make money so he could free himself from work, so he could work full time for Theosophy. That's when he went to South America, uh, but it fell through. It didn't work out, but he, that's when he caught the fever, which eventually, you know, years later uh, took him. But in 1884, he finally was able to get out of New York and go to Europe. And, and we, we know he then went to India on behalf of HPB. And he was still a young guy there, you know, standing up for her with that whole Kulam affair. He, he, he straightened that out. But I was going to say it was then he writes, I think it's in letters that have helped me. He had a real crisis and he was, a, you know, considering throwing in the towel or whatever that meant. But but he. Uh, you know, he he overcame that. And that's when he when he came back to New York in 1885. That's when he just like totally took off, you know, lecturing all over the country. He started the Path magazine, you know, all, all his stuff. So uh, but he was tested. Uh, he was really tested in those few years there before he came back. So, <sighs> Yeah, and HPB too at the end of her life. You yeah. know, she was at her sickest on her deathbed when she wrote the Secret Doctrine. Right. Right. You know, so right. uh, um, you know what we perceive as illness. I mean, we've all had this coronavirus, you know, scare, and uh, so we know what it feels like to get hit hard. You know, and 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 that has uh, uh, also an effect on us. Uh, galvanizing uh, I think for most people you know when they have a health crisis uh, they reorder their priorities you know they uh, say okay you know if my life force is limited what's important you know uh, right now you know and uh, if I'm not going to be in this body forever um, what am I here for what am I doing and each each one of us, he, he uh, says this too, and HPB as well. Uh, we're here for a reason, you know, our own reason, but we're also here for other people, you know, <laughs> and not just for ourselves. So okay. that, uh, and not, we, we don't maybe think about it unless we have those, until we have those crises. And mm -hmm. it can actually galvanize us in moving forward and cutting to the chase of realizing and actually uh, living the type of life that we're meant to live. I mean, per people who don't find their purpose in life um, can get very depressed. You know, mm -hmm. they could really, they can really suffer. And uh, I think a lot of what Judge speaks to is depression. You know, we know when you have these uh, waxing and waning uh, diseases like Lyme disease or dengue fever or mm -hmm. even the coronavirus, the long COVID, um, there, there are big mood swings that come with that. Very, very challenging mood swings that come with that. But on the other side, you know, on, on the recovery side of it, um, you know, we uh, strengthen our connection to I think our higher astral David don't you you know mm -hmm. being you know mm -hmm. so it's a crisis that turns into an opportunity depending upon what we uh, what we uh, make of it so it's like our own personal uh, reckoning and by the time we're sick 
on the outside plane, and he said it, he says this in the quotation book, <clears throat> uh, illness is a result of uh, a, a loss of faith and confidence um, on mm -hmm. the inner plane, mm -hmm. on the inner plane. And the, the crisis on the inner plane manifests eventually on the physical plane, and then it's working itself out of our being. Mm -hmm. So we're sort of sloughing off. Uh, you know, it just goes to show you how important our thoughts and our feelings are. We're not consciously aware of what we're generating, uh, but to our own detriment and getting a hold of our vehicle and saying, okay, instead of just free associating and getting pulled into the lower astral, you know, into our lower nature, you know, there's that uh, eternal dance of our higher and our lower. So the question is, where are we going to park ourselves? You know, um, yeah, uh, from mm -hmm. moment to moment to moment. And that practice, uh, once once we get going, though, um, we reap the benefits karmically, you know, of sustaining a practice. And mm -hmm. we, you know, the, I think for me, um, also, Judge's message is very much of just keep putting the work in, you know, um, silently and faithfully. And uh, that's what you're going to carry with you, you know, from life to life. That's 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 what you want your luggage to look like, you know, um, and uh, so that you can access it in the future. You know, um, that's uh, that's what the work is about, you know. Um, yeah. So are we good? We are good. Beautiful. Thank you so very much, Helena. What a wonderful presentation.